I heard Matt Bebo say last night, why can't the Kennedy School be the norm? The Kennedy School being not a school anymore that has the best gardens of any school in Portland, but there's no kids there. Why can't that be the norm? And when, because I have been doing work around democracy and almost no other political work for 15 years now, um, what I hear from all of you wonderful folks, it all goes through these really weird <laughs> cycles inside my brain and the rest of my body that's kind of a radical democracy lens. And I think that's a really good question. And is the answer to figure out how to get two schools that are better than the Kennedy School's garden next year and four schools after that and six schools after that and again we're doing kind of one school garden at a time. Or perhaps is the answer to think in terms of pushing the envelope of democracy and thinking what do we need? Well clearly we're in an urgent situation. Right? It is an emergency on planet Earth and everyone here I, I think knows that, yes? Yeah. Yeah. We're in an emergency situation. We have 10 years to cut our climate change gases by 80%. And that's according to the lead scientists. It might turn out it needs to be 99%. Who knows? 10 years, 80% cut. So I think to myself, what would it look like for us to get the Kennedy School's gardens as the model for all of the school's gardens in Portland? Not in 10 years, but in three or four. What would that look like? What does it mean for us to be thinking as the sovereign people, not as neighborhood organizations only, or activist groups only, and there's nothing wrong with that, but to push the envelope a lot faster and further. And that's why I'm so interested in we as the sovereign people, that there is no authority, there is no power greater than us. And it's hard for me to imagine that if we asked, if we polled, everybody across the city and we said, do you want to see a really fine organic community garden run by the kids in every school in Portland with the food being generated there, feeding the kids, and they, you know, they would be generating the food and they would be harvesting it and they would be feeding themselves. Who would say no to that? I can't imagine. There may be some power holders, there may be some corporations, but they don't have legitimate rights. They are not the people. They claim, they claim rights all over the place, but they're not the people. So who cares? Who cares? And I'm going to read you, I mean, it, you know, I might sound glib saying who cares, but in a few minutes I'm going to get to what's happening on the other coast. And you're going to go, wow. They don't care, and they're getting away with it. They, the people of the other coast, are in uprising in a very extraordinary way. So, and then I heard, I think it was also Matt yesterday say, might have been another speaker, it was a lovely um, line drawing slide saying, the most efficient way to harvest rainwater is at the scale of full blocks. Block scale rainwater harvesting. Much more efficient way to do it than at the, you know, full neighborhood level or at the private property level. And once again, I think, through this radical democracy lens. How do we get there? Not in 20 years, but tomorrow. How do we start the process? What does it look like for we to see ourselves as we the people? What would that look like as we push ourselves forward? Um, and again, the populace understood this in the late 1800s, and there really hasn't been anything massive going on since then where we understand who we are. What would that look like? Give me some shout outs about other things that at the local level we need to change urgently at the city. I'm not saying it has to be done all at once, but at the scale of city or county, what could we do much more effectively as we the people than we could as activist organizations? So walkable neighborhoods as essential. What else? What's that? Ban? Better public transportation. How about outstanding public transportation? How about free public transportation? Super insulation for every building. What's the first word? 
commons ownership of vehicles, durable goods, tools. Commons ownership. The whole issue of the commons, a huge issue that you folks are paying a lot of attention to, the commons. I mean, the, the city repair, the T-horse, the, the extraordinary. Imagine taking that idea of the commons and pushing it much further in the next couple of years. What else? For Portland as a food forest. And somebody else said? Feed in tariff, something that's very powerful in Europe to move renewable energy much more quickly. I missed it. No pesticides in, in public parks, public spaces. Local and free currencies. So you get the point, right? Push. And then that's where we usually stop, right? We have these dreams, and we think of them as dreams. And then what? <laughs> Stop consumerism, sure. Do, does anyone have a vision in this room yet of how do, we, how do we get there? Let me tell you what I'm doing tomorrow afternoon that I'm really excited about, and I hope some of you come to it. I hope a lot of you come to it is from 1 to 4 tomorrow. The program says 2 to 4, but it's 1 to 4 in this space. I'm going to be facilitating a democratic conversation. Whoever shows up, we're going to sit in a big circle with a couple of big um, whiteboards of, for writing down brainstorms. And we're going to say to ourselves, if we need to cut our carbon emissions by 80% within 10 years in Portland, Let's just assume that that means we have to cut our car use by at least 80% within 10 years in Portland. Now, if everyone here starts driving less, or if the people here who, don't own car, who own cars get rid of their cars, that's fine. But I don't think that's the scale that gets us 80% cut in 10 years. So once again, let's push. What if we understood that we are the sovereign people, that we do govern ourselves, that the Constitution gives us all the legal authority we need to do this, and we understand that we can't wait much longer, I don't think we can wait much, we can't wait any longer for our governments to, to do this for us, so we're, we're gonna have a democratic conversation for three hours tomorrow. And I just have this fantasy, and who knows how real it is, we'll see, and I'm actually, I'm moving here at the end of the year approximately, so I'm really excited about <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. So I have this crazy idea that tomorrow afternoon, we're going to start this process that puts us in the driver's seats. Probably a bad way to look, bad analogy. In the bicycle seat. In the bus, bi in the bus, path, bus driver's seat, whatever. And we're going to start pushing the envelope of 80% cut in 10 years. For basic recognizing of Portland's climate and water and everything else in 10 years. I mean, this is, this is a real physical, ecological, planetary boundary that the scientists are pretty much unanimously telling us is, is happening. So what would that look like? And my, and my visioning is that if we started these democratic conversations every couple weeks or once a month on the topic of a transportation transition planning process, and starting energy descent planning processes and everything else, which um, Transition Portland is already doing, I understand. Yay, Transition Portland. They're, they're on tomorrow evening and Saturday. Saturday evening and Sunday morning. Important work. That how cool it would be, and also I have to add in, I loved what Starhawk said a couple nights ago about how we have to fundamentally transform the way we do group process. That was wonderful exercises. Do you agree that she put us through a couple days ago? So that once again, we're creating much more inclusive and non-judgmental processes where we figure out how to work with everybody, not just our allies and our networks. So imagine if these conversations are growing and that they very quickly, these are planning processes. We're gonna institute this stuff. We're gonna cut a bunch of cars, most of them. We have to replace them with something that's really efficient and elegant 
and it's going to be sure. Feet and light rail and all sorts of other stuff, bicycles, buses, whatever it is, whatever we the people need to, you know, need. We're going to figure this out. And imagine if these conversations just kept growing really fast in scale so that in just a couple months we're like, oh, well, it's, this is way too big. So we're going to break into, into Portland quadrants, four groups, and start continuing the conversation at that level. And then a few months later, oh, this now is way too big. So we're going to continue this conversation now at the neighborhood level. And all of a sudden, neighborhoods network together are coming up with not, a, not just a neighborhood plan, but they're coming up with the transportation transition plan for the whole city network together. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. Yeah. Can we do that? <laughs>